Hi, this is Barry, and welcome to the Simplicity Zen podcast. Today, our guest is Sensei Koshin Paley Ellison. He is an author, Zen teacher, union psychotherapist, and ACPE certified chaplaincy educator. After working more than a decade as a chaplain and a psychotherapist, Koshin co-founded the New York Center Zen Center for um, Contemplative Care. Koshin, be- Koshin began his formal Zen training in 1987, and he's a recognized Soto Zen teacher by the American Zen Teacher Association, the White Plum Asanga, and Soto Zen Buddhist Association. He serves on the board of directors at the Soto Zen Buddhist Association, New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care, and the Bear Center of Buddhist Studies. Is it Bar or Bear? Barry. Bear. Oh, Barry. Oh. And then... Um, and to round this all this out, Koshin began his Zen training with John Dido Lori, received Jukai from Pat Inkyo O'Hara, and Dharma transmission from Dorothy Dai in Friedman. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So you mentioned uh, briefly to me you're um, kind of continuing your Zen studies with a Japanese sensei. Can you tell us his name and a little bit about him? Yeah, his name is Genyu Kojima Roshi, and he lives in Enna City, which is in between Kyoto and Tokyo, and he's the 20th abbot of his temple, and just a wonderful teacher and practitioner, and has the wonderful balance of practice between the relative and the absolute, you could say. And his family has had a long tradition of training at Eheji and has a connection there and where he also teaches. And to me, it's just the beauty of ongoing practice. And what inspires me right now is the how we're never done and Gyoji Dokan, that expression for Dogen about continuous practice is a real thing and that we are never arriving. And so finding him as a teacher was a wonderful moment to be able to go deeper into ceremony and my life as a Zen priest Mm -hmm. and as really learning the traditional Sotashu forms. And it feels like a super enlivening way for me to practice as well as our Sangha. And we've been adapting some of our forms to, and it's just wonderful to really realize, even though I've been practicing a certain way for close to 40 years to suddenly you know, put down the clackers and use the bell and just do different things mm-hmm. is so wonderful way to keep things fresh and a way of actually honoring our lineage and where things come from. Mm-hmm. It looks like you have a a, a formal set of shoe rakasu on. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's from him. Is that sort yeah. of, yeah. And yeah. my, um, my koan teacher, uh, Russell, he he recently got his second Dharma transmission from in the uh, White Plum Saga. He, he has one, that, I think, identical to that, but brown. Mm-hmm. Is that one black or brown? It's black. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, I like the um, the grooves. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I, normally I kind of ask the timeline stuff later, but I, I can't help myself right now. So how did you um, how did you meet with him? How did you find him? It's a very funny story. It's a social media story. So, <laughs> so Chodo, who's my husband and also a Zen teacher and Zen priest uh, with the white plum. And we had been teaching before the pandemic in Japan at Kyoto University and Sophia University and uh, uh, Tokyo University and also at a conference in Niigata. and at the medical schools and teaching Soto Zen for medicine, which Mm -hmm. is a big part of what we offer and what we're engaged in all the time. And it's quite wonderful to, we were doing this 
kind of larger offering uh, for many people in Kyoto University at the medical school. And it was February of 2020, the end of February, and where the world was beginning to shut down. Mm -hmm. And as the COVID-19 pandemic was happening, and I received this message saying that there was this teacher, one of this uh, Soto Shu teachers wanting to come to the talk and his name was Genyu Kojima. And uh, so I actually just DM'd him on Instagram and we began to have conversation. And what was so wonderful about COVID is that we started offering these ongos, online ongos with 16 different teachers. Mm -hmm. And so to Zen teachers, both from the United States and Japan. So I invited him to participate in this online ongo. And that is how our relationship began. And I was just so moved by his talks and his clarity and foundation. Mm -hmm. And it just became clear that he was a teacher for me. And so then I wrote him a very, after some time, I wrote him a a very long and sincere letter about how I've been training for some time and 40-ish years and (laughs) ready to um, go deeper. Mm -hmm. And I would be honored to be his disciple. And so quite wonderful to deepen with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I can relate. I, I, I could never see myself not being a Zen student on some level, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so is he, is, are you guys communicating in English? Like I, or are yes. you, or, yes. yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, he, come, he comes here and I go there mm-hmm. also, yeah. And, does he come from a family temple, a family soto, like a parish temple? Is that his home? Yes, yes. He has a um, a very beautiful and large family temple. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so it's been in their family for 20 generations. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. Does it, do they have a soto there? A soto? A soto, like a, a, a monk's hall? At his temple, they yeah. do not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but AAG, which is very close to his temple, is they have quite a large one. Yeah. Have yeah. Have you been to AAG? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. With him, we have not gone together, but we'll go together in September. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did yeah. you do? Um, I always mess up this pronunciation. The Zuse is that ceremony? Um, Zuis or <laughs> it's one of those words that I pronounce wrong. Oh, Zuise. Yeah, so when, yeah. you be, when you become the abbot for the day yeah. at, uh-huh. at AAG and Sojiji, uh-huh. no, I've not not done that because most of my training has been in the American system. Mm-hmm. And so that is very different from the Japanese system. So perhaps one day I will. And, yeah. but, you know, the main point for me is not to do that, but to have deeper a deeper relationship. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna control myself and not ask you any more historical <laughs> questions because we'll, we'll get to that later. I, I want to he- hear about what you're doing now. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about the um, New York Center for Contemplative Care and like basically what are you doing? What are your programs? We'll talk about how you started it later, but kind of like wh- what what's available to people and mm. you know how you know, what are you offering to that people can participate in. Yeah, so the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care, right right now, our offerings really are in three main areas. They're all grounded in the first area, which is, of course, Soto Zen practice. And so we offer 18 periods of Zazen a week. Um, So we have a very robust and wonderful Sangha that is hybrid. And so that it's both here at our place in New York City, but also we have practitioners from every continent mm-hmm. um, practicing have, with us. You have daily sittings, phys- physical? Yes, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And 
So that feels amazing. And so, and we have ceremony uh, three times a week. Mm-hmm. And, and then also have Zazen Kai's, you know, full day or half day sittings every month. Mm-hmm. And we also offer Sashin uh, three times a year. And so really, really great. And so we have a, a very robust group of students from around the world and really beautiful dedication of spirit and a lot of warmth and humor, which is something I appreciate a lot. And so there's that. And then we also have education programs. So we're very interested in bringing these teachings and the application of Soto Zen into how we show up in uh, how we care for people. Mm-hmm. And we really subscribe to Kobo Daishi's teaching. You know, the depth of someone's practice is by how you can measure by how they're of serving others. And so I think that we can get very caught. I know I have in my life where I was such a jerk, you know, early in my Zen path, where I just thought it was about me and how I'm doing. And like, and uh, so we have these programs called, one of them is called Foundations and Contemplative Care, which is a nine month training, which is based on the 16 Bodhisattva precepts. It's really, to me, super amazing. We've had about, 900 people who go through that training. And does this give people CPE credit? It does not. No, it's um, just like an awesome training, you Mm -hmm. know, that well, that most people say changed their life. And so pretty great. And then we also have a fellowship in contemplative medicine for physicians and nurse practitioners and uh, which is like, awesome. And then that is based on the Four Noble Truths. So the curriculum is, so we're like full on Soto Zen Buddhist, you know, so we are not doing a mindfulness thing or anything like that, which, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it's just not what we've chosen to yeah. offer. And so people really m- move their way. These incredible physicians move their way from, deep suffering to the Eightfold Path. And so it's just just amazing. And we also, as you were mentioning, we do offer CPE where- Oh, you do separately, okay. We're the only Zen Center that I know of that has fully accredited uh, ACPE as a accreditation. So it's just really awesome. Is this something Uh, people can do remotely or is this an in-person program, the CPE? The CPE program, have all the other programs are remote, but that is an in person. Yeah. yeah, is that just yeah. is that because that's how you think it works best, or is that a requirement of the accreditation? It is not a requirement. It's just how I love to teach, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. especially because when there's six people, I really love physically sitting in a circle. Mm-hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with online education or CPE. It's just not what I feel called to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And yeah, we offer so many things. So the other pillar of what we offer is care. And so we have awesome bereavement programs and which happen, there's usually two bereavement groups every eight weeks. And we have ones for LGBTQI plus, as well as pet bereavement and just folks. So like anyone who's encountering the challenge of loss, you know, as Kisa Gotami taught us, you know, so we are uh, realizing we all lose something and have to reckon with our grief. So, mm-hmm. and we also meet with people uh, one-on-one for grief support and providing an extra layer of spiritual and emotional support, as well as we accompany people through their dying process. And so Mm -hmm. we'll do that for their and their loved ones uh, from oftentimes the advent of serious uh, diagnosis and prognosis through their dying process. Because most people lose 
their care team as their illness progresses. They lose their primary care person, they might lose their oncologist, they lose their palliative care team, and when they mm -hmm. move into hospice. And so there's all these losses that the person and their family leave and lose. And so we provide that extra layer of support through that whole process, including helping the loved ones wash their loved one's body and shrouding them and really caring for them. How do people that find out one? about that aspect of your, your offerings? That is a word of mouth, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, have you called the monks, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah. It sounds like this is a full-time job for you. You know, your, your career is working for this. Is that correct? my full life is uh of service you know as i you know when i ordained it'll be next week will be 23 years ago you know it was uh 21 years ago and uh i was just very clear that i wouldn't do i was going to make every decision to and with and for the buddha dharma and so that remains clear I do also work one day a week, uh, sort of one day a week with uh, uh, with my amazing people that I have the honor of working with the, in psychotherapy. And so I've been working with the same group of people for more than 17 years. Mm -hmm. And so I just am dedicated to seeing them through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So do you and your husband, do you have any kids? We have two cats, two, cats. two main coon cats. Uh -huh. And uh, there are kids. Yeah. They're very large. They're about 20 pounds. So like- Yeah, main coon, I, first time I saw one, I thought it was like, a, a, like a, 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 a bobcat or something. When we were in our old apartment, <laughs> our, our super, who was literally, his name was Butch. He was like this like very- <laughs> like his name but uh he came into our apartment once and was like holy shit what, what the hell is that what is that it's like a wild animal in here and he ran out of the apartment that's funny and yeah, they're the they're the sweetest animals though incredibly sweet and yeah. smart yeah um so you and having come through the white plum tradition I imagine you went through the Koan curriculum. Is that correct? I, I did, yeah. yeah. Do you offer that training yourself? I do. I do. And uh, yeah, some of my students, I would say the majority of them do Shikantaza. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that there are some students that are immersed in that curriculum. And one of our students is kind of probably may finish in the next couple of years. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. It's just so to me is a very wonderful form for understanding compassion. Mm -hmm. What um is the how do people go from the shikantaza to the koans? Is it self selecting? Do you think like oh maybe it'd be good for this guy or this this lady or how do you? Uh, I kind of usually wait until they are very grounded in their practice. And many people ask about it because they want something to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, well, they're, cause they're kind of don't know how to work with their mind. So they like, want to just like, give me a koan, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. cause I've heard about them, but I usually wait until they have a very grounded concentration and i find that that's much more useful for them and because once they're very concentrated and grounded not that all of us are just now i'm concentrated grounded but like you know most of the time you know then koans can become like a something to work with but until we're kind of more grounded and concentrated it just becomes like another thing to like rattle around you know so, mm -hmm. yeah how um so one thing i've learned doing these podcasts is um 
to my surprise initially was the wide range of criteria that teachers look for in passing someone through Moo. You know, some some teachers, you know, oh, you, you can answer it with gusto, good, let's move on. Or some people are basically, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, someone's looking for the great death, you know, mm-hmm. you know, and like let's let's go with that. I'm, if you feel comfortable sharing publicly, I'm curious where you find yourself on that spectrum. I wouldn't answer in those kinds of ways. Uh-huh. Um, to me, Dogasan is very intimate. Mm-hmm. And you kind of just know. And really learning how to trust the relationship and learn how to really, like, I feel like my role when I'm offering Dogasan is to really receive the person and to encourage and to hold the container of, in some ways of the bow, you know, that our, the form that we use for Dogasan is you come in and you offer a full bow. And usually you can tell by how someone bows whether they're actually in their experience or not Mm -hmm. and how they walk in the door. So to me, it's more about all of those indicators usually and the expressions of Mu are so different. Mm -hmm. And what it is for one person, it will be very different and important for another person. And so to me, I don't like to have a hard and fast rule about it, just that you have to, and to me, there's usually like, when the barrier has been passed through, there's this space between, this is what I experience, between myself and the other person that opens. And I'm looking for that. Yeah, I kind of feel Dokusan at his best isn't like teacher instructing students. It's kind of when mm-hmm. both Buddha natures gush forth equally. Like that's that's when it seems it's really cooking. Totally. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm guessing based on your va- highly valuing the somatic embodied aspect of it, I imagine you may not be a huge fan of online Dokusan. Uh, you, you feel like you I'm- can Touch those spaces not, online I'm, through Zoom? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly offer online Dogasan, you know, because mm-hmm. many of my students live at a great distance, you know, whether Brazil or Italy or wherever that is. And so, you know, it's very important. And to me, it really depends on how we hold space wherever we are. Mm-hmm. You know, are you really attentive and kind of really showing up? And I think that actually there's something very important about the effort that is made. And it is really hard. The one thing that I have learned is the incredible importance of both people making the effort of actually meeting in person, at least once in a while mm-hmm. like once a like once a year mm-hmm. is really important and very very important and like like my student from italy she's coming you know for a session you know like it, it's just you know and she's very serious <laughs> and sincere student and yeah really important mm-hmm. um you know the, the the my koan teacher Russell Russell Mitchell. Uh, we started doing koans together like right I think kind of right as COVID hits, and so we uh, you know we do it through Zoom, and so we didn't get to meet for a couple of years mm-hmm. until after we started, and I was really curious how the dynamic would be. I uh, I used to be heavily involved with this Grateful Dead online Grateful Dead community of all weird things, but. And I, and, I, and I got really and I got really close to this one guy and you know, we were good kind of online friends and he came out to um, San Francisco for this concert and we met up 
And I was really surprised to how the chemistry we had online didn't translate to in person. You know, it was just, we didn't have anything, you know, it was just, it's just the chemistry wasn't there. It was really weird in our kind of, in our friendship kind of fizzled after that. So I was, whereas uh, with Russell, you know, we, you know, you know, I meet with him, you know, sometimes three times a week, you know, for years. And so we have a pretty intimate relationship. And I was really curious how that would transfer when we finally met in person, which we did about a year ago. And, um, and it was just, I felt like there was no, it was just an easy transition to, you know, like that. I, I didn't feel like our intimacy had increased by meeting in person. It like, it just seemed like a natural flowing forward of that. I was, uh, um, I found that really interesting. So, which I, I'm a big fan of online dokusan, but I was, it made me realize that there is the possibility of developing those connections, even through the, the Zoom meeting. Yeah. Yeah, it's very can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so um, do you, you guys mention um, uh, services? Do you do it as like pre zazen or after zazen, or is it its own scheduled activity that's not connected to a sitting period? Or like how? Uh, okay. how you, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So during the. Okay, so on Monday night and Wednesday night and Sunday mornings, we do a regular, what we call our regular service, which is um, uh, Heart Sutra and Shosai Myo Kichijo Dharani and Emejuku Kanagyo. So those Heart Sutra services. in Japanese or English? Right now we've been doing it in English and we do the uh, Shosai Myo in the uh, and the Emejuku Kanagyo, both in English and Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we do those. And then on Sashin, of course, we do more. We do the Dahishan Durrani at night and usually the identity of relative and absolute and the, the jewel mirror of Samadhi uh, at the noon service and along with the ancestors. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, has working with the Japanese teacher, I don't think I remember his name without seeing it written. So I was gonna say your Japanese teacher for us in the interview. Um, have you incorporated any of this, the forms that he's introduced to you into your your services? Like you'd mentioned yeah, bells and said clackers, for example. Yeah, so it's just, we just have changed some small things, you know, mm. not everything, but uh, yeah. I was trained, you know, in White Plum. My personal lineage is from the White Plum, and so that, that's um, a mixture of Rinzai forms, which actually I never knew, you know. And so, so the clackers, like even using clackers at all, was really uh, that's more of a Rinzai form, and so mm -hmm. we stopped using those. And we used to face in at certain periods and face out. At certain periods, and now we just face the wall. And so the facing in and the first period and the last period, which is the way I was trained. Um, and that's true at ZFLA and Zen Monastery, and mm -hmm. I think at most of the white plum places. And but now we just face the wall. Yeah. Um, so those are those are the big, big thing. Yeah. What do you feel? the traditional sutra service adds to practice? Ooh. To me, it's a wonderful, to me, the, the different forms of practice are so exciting. So sitting, walking, cleaning, chanting, like so using your voice and, and also in harmony of the one. And mm -hmm. so to me, like the chanting, practice as well as bowing in the ceremony and learning how to be in relationship to me it's one of the richest uh practice opportunities to get out of self because it is not about you and most people have the most difficulty with chanting services they're like oh it's too weird or mm -hmm. whatever that is and it's just a great to me it's been super important and getting out of my own small self and realizing 
that facing the altar, which is facing traditionally the altar is on the north, is facing the north is to face Buddha nature and to face the Bodhi mind and the Buddha Dharma. And facing south is to face the kind of the relative and the what's personal. And so the service is all facing the north. And so learning how to orient ourselves around like during the full bow, I just love it so, so much where you like put your, your little brain on the ground and lift up the, the Bodhi mind. And so it's like so awesome to be able to oh, just give your brain like a healthy brainwash. Mm -hmm. like like wash it with Buddha nature so that where it's like all oh, right it's not all about me and what I want and what I think mm -hmm. great so I think that those services really and also the teachings of the heart sutra the teachings of the Emejuku Kanagyo and the teachings of the Emejuku Kanagyo very powerful Mm -hmm. And to really hear it and say it and to chant it and put it through your body and the echoes, the dedications are filled with teaching. Mm -hmm. Like the first dedication is always to Shakyamuni Buddha because like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And to like getting out of our little life, you know, and then we always, at least in, our school, we thank Dogen Zenji and Keizan Zenji and to like, to thank them for creating this Soto Zen path that we're on. Like mm -hmm. it's so important. And all the people who support our awakened nature, you know, it's just, just sitting Zazen, you, you would miss that. Mm -hmm. Do you guys do, um song of zazen by hakuin and bodhisattva vow by tori Inchi. do you guys add that to your service no no no, no. i've noticed some 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 white plum places will add that in or diamond sangha yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um i meant to ask you this earlier um you guys you have the um, grief support group i'm probably phrasing that awkwardly but do you guys revolve it around jizo at all i know that's kind of a growing thing in North America, kind of transplanting the Jizo ceremony and, you know, um, as part of the grieving process. Do you guys work with that at all? Yeah, well, Chodo is uh, the one who runs that. He's my husband and he runs the grief and bereavement support. Mm -hmm. And he um, does once a year, we have a, actually, I participate as a support in the Jizo, the Mitsuko Kuyo ceremony which mm -hmm. is the water water baby ceremony. And we actually have people fly in from all over to come to the ceremony. It's for anyone who has had an abortion or miscarriage or their parents or the child has predeceased their parents. Mm -hmm. So we've had, we've had, you know, parents who come in, especially in this time where many, you know, children are, dying by suicide so like we've had a lot of parents come in that way and so we do do that every year and so that is that ceremony is dedicated to jizo and so they uh, each you know are leave with a jizo statue and uh, and they are able to name their child which some of them have not especially with miscarriages and abortion and having the opportunity to name their child and pull the paper crane and we have this beautiful uh windows covered in cranes that from all the people who have come and named their children so it's just really beautiful that those spirits are and people are here with us every day mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so your center there, do you have any moment, uh, re residential students? We don't. At the moment, our center is not residential. We have a loft. It's a, a 3,000 square foot loft in Soho. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not in Soho. 
the Chelsea yeah. part of Manhattan. I'm not familiar with the. Oh uh, yeah, so New York Chelsea geography. is a neighborhood in Manhattan, the island of Manhattan, off the coast of New Jersey, mm -hmm. and it's uh, on 23rd Street. So it's kind of very, it's a very central location. Mm -hmm. And that, that was very important to us because we have students from international students in New Jersey and Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island, Connecticut, upstate New York. So it's just very central. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rent's got to be astronomical, I imagine. Uh, it's cost like what Manhattan costs. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least $100 a month, right? At least 100 Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, kind of looking at the um, demographics of your students, are you, is it mostly younger people, middle age, older, a mix? You know, you go to some centers and it's pretty old group and um, some groups, you know, more often Rinzai seems they kind of have a younger cohort. And so I'm kind of curious what demographics you guys are. You, you are, are there people of color that are coming to your group or, you mm -hmm. know, um, you, know, you know, are there LGBTQ, I, I always mess up the new acronym, I'm sorry, but, you know, is there a, a good group of that coming, you know, I mean, I'm just curious what, what's your song like? Our song, we're about to do another survey, so we always like to survey to try to get the demographics, so I don't have the exact numbers, but I would say we have a very, uh, we had a few Japanese priests who are just here this week. Mm -hmm. And they're actually still here today, and some dear friends of ours. And they were like, "Wow, so many young people! <laughs> like, how amazing!" So, like, I sometimes don't think like that. So, yeah, we have a, a number of uh, lots of young people, and also some older folks. And it seems like since COVID, the older folks tend to come on Zoom, mm -hmm. and you know, feel more comfortable with that. <laughs> And yeah, it's, I wouldn't say it's wildly racially diverse, but it is, we definitely have uh, racial diversity and sexual diversity. And we do have lots of LGBTQIA people as well as Bi BIPOC folks. <coughs> Excuse and me. And we do, and we do have a um, BIPOC practice group too. So that is oh, great. Yeah. And uh, what are, what are the practice paths at your center? Do you guys offer Jukai and then ordination if they want it? And then is there an assistant yeah. teachership or is it, you know, you know, ordination, then Dharma transmission, if ever? Like, what is kind of like the, the funnel of someone's practice career, so to speak? Uh, <laughs> <we're>... <coughs> Excuse me, getting over a cold. Oh, goodness. Um... I would say that, you know, first of all, we have our first gate is Tangario. And so we, um, and we usually, for someone to sit Tangario, usually they have to have been practicing at the center for at least a year and already serving and finding like, this is, you know, like, this is my home. <clears throat> and, and starting to meet with one of the teachers and then deciding <coughs> to commit to that mm -hmm. and to that relationship and then this at Tongario. Is that a and, one day sitting or how long is your Tongario? Yeah, it's just one day, just mm -hmm. one day. And, uh, but very powerful, you know, when I think we decide just to slow everything down and make things much more formal. And I think that that is actually very supportive. And it's not the, it's not the way, but it's we found it to be supportive. And then after a while, after they've come to a couple of sessions, you know, and then they really feel because I feel like actually until you sit a couple of sessions, you don't really understand what Zen practice is. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so after they do that, they, they might, and actually, and then do a year of precept study with us that then they could begin to sew their rocks. Mm -hmm. And so again, we like slow all of this down. And 
so that it becomes more meaningful for people so that they really like, oh yeah, I really want to sew this rocks in. And um, it's beautiful. And then, you know, after a couple of years, perhaps, you know, not always, but like, you know, we would just watch people very carefully and, and with care and with a lot of love and see who's showing up and showing themselves as a leader mm -hmm. and, and showing up kind of all the time and just like really available and serving. And we watch how they do that. And every once in a while, we will have a shoe sale, mm -hmm. a, a lay shoe sale. And so that's a person who models practice. And we do the shoe sale training uh, for a year or a year and a half or two years. So someone's shoe show for a, a year and a half or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so like they won't have their host on Shiki until then, and actually, it's we we really wait and to see how they're forming mm -hmm. and learning about that, and so, um, yeah, so like that's really where we are at, at a, as a sangha right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have had we have our second Lei Shuso serving now, and she's amazing. Mm -hmm. and really inspiring people and i think that is actually and there are some people who are getting curious about ordination mm -hmm. and for us now that i'm connected to a japanese teacher we would be going through the japanese system and so that would be you know you would have to sit those angos you know and so that would be really important to do. So, I mean, there's no official Soto Shoe, um, um, what do they call it? The, um, you know, essentially a real place where you can do an ongo and get credit towards Soto Shoe credit in America is my understanding. So would Not you have- in America. Yeah, so would you require your ordination and SUI candidates to do an ongo in Japan? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they would need to do two. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it depends on your education level. If you haven't gone to college, it's more than two. <clears throat> exactly. That is true. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I, and also we have, you know, many, many Japanese priest friends. And so we know kind of these, these two different temples that we feel really great about in their training. Which ones and, are those? Well, one of them is Toshoji, and, <laughs> uh -huh. um, and there's another temple in Nagasaki, and they are both kind of international places where mm -hmm. there's people from Europe and South America and and Japanese people and men and women together. Um, so it's just a very cool um, places for engaging their training. And um, yeah, so excited about that possibility. And I think it's also for us, we see it as, you know, people who want to fully commit and that is not right for a lot of people's lives, you know, and mm -hmm. that's good. Mm -hmm. And we're really looking at how do we honor lay practice thoroughly. And so we're also talking to, you know, my, my Japanese teacher <laughs> Ooh. and, uh, Sorry. And our other friends, to, like, there are actually part of the Japanese system are other ways of honoring lay practitioners and empowering them in different ways. And so mm -hmm. just learning from not having to reinvent the wheel here. And Could you just, give an example of um, lay empowerment options? <clears throat> well, one of them is a lay shoe. So, you know, and yeah. so I think that that's one of them. And then, you know, other ways I'm learning about. And so I'm just excited to learn and to find new ways of supporting people. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you have a fairly senior koan student. Let's say that they finish their curriculum and maybe start doing some, you know, assistant teaching and so forth. Could you see 
empowering someone as a through Dharma transmission as a koan teacher without being ordained? Is that a path that you could foresee for some of your students? It, I don't know, and <laughs> but but like I would, at this point, we're just exploring and wondering, and like it's not. I wouldn't say no, and I wouldn't say yeah. No. Great. I appreciate it. I, I'm really interested in the kind of sociological aspects of North American Zen. So I appreciate your patience with all my, my questions. No, I'm totally interested too. And I'm like really trying to, you know, I was brought up in the North American system mm -hmm. and, you know, fully did that. And now like learning, I feel like I'm just beginning to learn other things about the Soto Shoe system that some of the things are just so wise, you know? So I'm just learning about a ton and I don't even know what I'm learning in a way. And I think after like, I'll be going to Japan several times in the next year. And so just look forward to learning more. And I just think the the dumber we are the better in a certain way and like really learning to like wow maybe i don't have to reinvent anything but i just have to learn more and listen more mm -hmm. and so I, I appreciate your questions and to me it's like the the questions are the most important mm -hmm. and not having to do anything quickly mm -hmm. and not being attached to the outcome either it's like that amazing teacher shindo yamaroshi you know, who is the first woman to serve as a director at Sojiji. Mm -hmm. So things are changing there too. And she's saying, you know, that her teaching that we can't control the outcome, but we can really pay complete attention to fostering good conditions. And I just felt like that's so, so how do we create the conditions now so that people feel engaged and supported and so that let's see where things go mm -hmm. but let's like really make sure what we can work with is what we have now mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> i have um two more questions before we kind of dive into the autobiographical stuff um the first is and you don't have to go in depth about this i just kind of curious what your high level view of this is um so you're you're a psychotherapist or psychoanalyst, I guess maybe is a more accurate way to term it. I'm curious, what do you see as the difference between psychological healing and spiritual growth? Are they on the same plane? Um, well, I would say like you know, as the in the Soto Shu, they talk about the South and the North, right? Uh -huh. And so the South is kind of the personal stuff, mm -hmm. right? And so we don't we don't open our zagu like to the south, right? Mm -hmm. And we open it to the north, and where Buddha nature is, and the Buddha Dharma is the mm -hmm. sangha. Uh, so for me, the being a psychotherapy, which I really encourage everyone to find a fantastic person that you want to entrust with your mind, and. Uh, is really self work. You know? It's really, really super important, and and in some ways we can't really do as I would call it the north work until we really don't get stuck in the south. And yeah. if that's making sense, and and to me, it's always like a you have to keep looking at where you're getting stuck anyway. You know, and but I find that like great psychotherapy is very helpful. I would say for like every serious student I have, it's because they've done a lot of good work in psychotherapy. Because I think that we all come to this practice because of some wound, because we're yeah. human, and just really important to like, look at our shit, you know, yeah. and and actually being interested in it and also understand that that is different than buddha dharma mm -hmm. it's not that they're like two different things it's just there's difference what what do you see as the um relationship between awakening and 
psychological conditioning or trauma does does um do you do you think <clears throat> awakening leaves psychological conditioning and trauma untouched do you think it wipes it out do you think there's some middle ground between that does the question have a, a broken premise i'd be curious to see what you think about that i would answer yes <laughs> depends and I think it's just really important to that we all like trauma, first of all, is like kind of the buzzword of our time right now. Mm -hmm. I write about it, you know, like it's it's like a real, you know, it's the word that we use. But you know, Shakyamuni Buddha was like rather wise and used another word called suffering, mm -hmm. you know and that we all have it, right? And we all are subject to it. And so just to realize that in a way it's like not anything that special, you know, like, yes, we have all of our trauma and our challenges and our difficulties and okay. Mm -hmm. you know? What are you gonna do with it? Um, so I know you gotta go relatively soon. Um, so could you kind of give like a, a little condensed narrative of, of, you know, why did you get into Zen? Who did you train with? Can, you know, just um, and maybe I'll interject with some questions as, you know, like, we're, like you know, why, why Zen? You know, why not Zoroastrianism or, you know? You know. <laughs> well, I mean, from one point of view, who knows, right? And some of them are human, so we like to, sew together a suture together a story but i can so i can tell you a story mm -hmm. you know that i come from a family of people who both died and survived the holocaust mm -hmm. and so i come from that kind of group who were kind of the crazy ones who were like everyone else in the family was like, you're crazy. That's not going to happen here. They're not going to round us up and set us on fire and put us in camps. And so my great grandparents were all the people were like, the shit is getting bad and we got to get out of here. This is not safe. And so the trauma that they, you could say, or the suffering that they experienced having to leave their whole families and the place they lived, you know, as refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, that history, you know, as most displaced people and people of victims of war, very common, you know, have lots of tra trauma and suffering in the, inside those families, like mm -hmm. pretty screwed up. Mm -hmm. Understandably, it's like, it's crazy. And uh, so I came from, a, you know, generations of good valued people who, you know, were, did Sorry. not know how to actually be loving. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there were, I grew up in a house with lots of abuse and uh, sexual abuse and physical abuse and verbal abuse and you know yet the, my family members were like high performing amazing uh individuals right mm -hmm. and so i just really saw that gap between you know what people say that they care about and believe in and what they do mm -hmm. which for me relates so much to shakyamuni buddha's teaching of suffering like that's suffering when our what we're doing and what we say we care about don't match that is suffering right mm -hmm. and it usually inflicts suffering and it was my case and so as a very young person i grew up in a super chaotic house and when i was eight years old i went to my grandfather's house who was like a refuge for me and then he used to save these National Geographics and we used to look through them. And at that time in the, this is in the 70s, the 1970s, you know, not the 1870s, I'm not that old, but uh, um, 
And there was a photographic uh, portrait of Tokyo. And in, I just remember turning this page and there was this image of this Japanese monk and the Ari Ragasa had those big bamboo hats, mm. slight smile. And all the people around him were blurred because they're like running around. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading, like just feeling entranced and the little caption just said, Zen Buddhist monk in Tokyo. And I was like, I want to be that. So you were a kid or a teenager? Like what hold are you? Eight one? years old. Eight years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when I was 12, 11, I started practicing Zazen with Sensei White, who was a, so a karate teacher and a Zen guy. What, and this, did you do karate with him or something? Yeah, but we used to sit for about sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes in Seiza mm-hmm. no, on a wood floor. Sorry about that. It was not for the faint of heart. And and he used to walk around us really slowly and say, you'll never be free until you can be still with your pain. Mm-hmm. And that continues to be a very powerful teaching to me. Was he an authorized Zen teacher or is it more mm-hmm. normal? Definitely not. And uh, and then when I was 17, I started studying with Daido, uh, Daido Roshi, and kind of informally going up to the monastery, which was pretty new at that time. This is like 1987. Mm-hmm. And then that's also when I met uh, Pat O'Hara, uh, Enki O'Hara, and she and Dido had a split and I went with her and I was still a student of hers for 22 years. And did koans with her, I assume? I did koans, yeah. And did you finish my the curriculum with her? Yes, yeah. And then 10 years ago, um, I, start, I changed teachers officially and became a student of Diane Friedman, who was a student of Maria Matheson Roshi and really great mm-hmm. and wonderful continuous practice with her for these years. If, it's, um, if it's not too personal, <clears throat> um, what motivated the switch of teachers? Uh, I needed a teacher who, like Diane, who was really interested in how to be loving in the midst of running a large organization. Mm -hmm. And Ankyo didn't have the, for me, it it was not a good fit for that. And I really needed that help. Mm-hmm. And at that stage and so that felt really important super important and and diane continues to be you know my personal teacher and which is wonderful and do you do koans with her as well no 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 no, no. Mm-hmm. and uh but she co-leads our sessions with us and she's mm-hmm. gonna be 95 this year amazing does yoga every day i mean incredible mm-hmm. and yeah and then Genyu Kojima Roshi you know which is mm-hmm. such a wonderful delightful surprise mm-hmm. since we're, for now one year one year so there's there's this kind of um mean going around in North American Zen that I've heard some people say that you know Zen in Japan is basically dead it's just temple sons you know, going the bare minimum time to get their temple certificate so they can take over the dad's temple and they're not really into it. There's no religious vocation. You know, so, I mean, I'm getting that you're, that's not this guy that you're working with in Japan at all. Nor these, my friend who's literally mm-hmm. sitting right out there, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Kiyoko Yama and Taiga Ito, there's like so many amazing teachers in Japan and very dedicated, super dedicated to the Buddha Dharma to and 
allowing things to flourish. I mean, the disparagement of another whole group of people mm -hmm. is not anything new <laughs> right. in the world, right? And so like, what does that even, who can really say that whether Zen is alive or dead in Japan? Mm -hmm. Who could say that? Who could yeah. say that? I mean, in fairness, I don't think people are saying it's entirely dead, but you know, there's no, some, I've, some I've heard the same thing. You know, as the, the you know that there's two. You know, there's not. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I stated it. And so, what what do you um? You know, so these people that have grown up in Zen, you know, and have done the like, like the traditional Soto shoe, you know, training where they're sleeping on their tons and you know up at three a.m. and um. You know, what, what is there some aspect of the practice that's enriched you that you didn't necessarily see in North American teachers or maybe have a particularly stronger focus or something? Is there a thing you can articulate in that area? More north facing. They're more not really so interested in themselves mm -hmm. and their status and their role. Mm -hmm. That's my experience. And there's something that's very enlivening about that and so fresh and inspiring. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, to me, like that's where do we find what's inspiring to us and what feels fresh and encouraging and allows our imagination to grow? You know, like to me, that seems like a beautiful place to pause because it's like to me that's the most important thing i don't actually care how anybody does that it could be rollerblading it could be <laughs> but like what opens you up to a life that is vast and wide and wholehearted you know mm -hmm. yeah. great so if um someone wanted to connect with you to um engage in any of your many faceted um areas of practice uh, is is through the, the the website of your organization is that the best touch point yeah through the organization um, zencare.org mm -hmm. or um i have a couple of books the newest one is called untangled walking the eightfold path to clarity courage and compassion mm -hmm. and that's a book about the four noble truths mm -hmm. and the other book is called wholehearted slow down help out and wake up which is uh, my book on the 16 bodhisattva precepts and yeah on instagram coach and Pale allison and as well as Zen center so great i really appreciate your time thank you so much a pleasure to speak with you okay could you uh hang out for just one second after the interview and ask you a quick question okay thanks